All right. Welcome to the very last lesson for the Age of Enlightenment. Although the notice this isn't of the revolution as well, but uh, anyways, I'm sorry the last one went a little bit longer than I meant to. Maybe I should have slid it into this one and maybe put this into uh, five parts. But I'm, well, I'm going to try to make the, I just said this is the last one. I'm going to try to make this one the last one. So in the last lesson, we talked a lot about the people of the Enlightenment. I didn't go into all of them. But I'd hit the big ones, the ones that, that really have affected the way the world is today, especially as Americans. You know. And just to reiterate a little bit, it's the one the guys that really affect American society are really uh, sorry, John Locke, number one on the list, uh, Montesquieu definitely, Voltaire definitely, um, and Adam Smith most definitely. Those guys are for, for the most influential uh, Enlightenment philosophers that helped shape uh, the ideas of the, of the uh, United States. Now, I have left off a lot of guys that I sh could have put in here if this was a U.S. history class, and that'd be guys like Benjamin Franklin, Thomas Jefferson, George Washington, uh, Thomas Paine, John Adams. Those guys were big-time Enlightenment philosophers, very much. They were, they were up there at the levels of Voltaire and John Locke, you could say. Uh, I just not focusing on them because I'm trying to show you where a lot of these ideas came from from outside. In fact, uh, Benjamin Franklin, uh, John Adams, and those guys actually referenced these guys all the time. They've referenced Adam Smith. They referenced um, Voltaire. They referenced uh, uh, John, especially John Locke. They definitely referenced John Locke a lot. Anyways, just to give you that background. Oh, sorry. Okay, so this is where we left off. There was one more person I wanted to talk about and put it into the last lesson, but again, I, I just it was it was a half an hour already. I apologize about that. So, anyways, I'm trying to keep these to about 20 minutes. Um, Madame de Pompadour is someone that is really good to talk about because we were just talking about a lot of guys, but women are very involved in the Enlightenment as well. Uh, yes, you're in a more a society that's more male dominated at the time. But when you have ideas like all men and women are born equal and uh, the idea that God has basically given this gift of, uh, of life to men and women, you know, women start saying, well, why can't we have more of a say? Yes, you have people like Queen Elizabeth who was the ultra powerful, but it's mostly, you know, if we're going to believe, well, if we're going to believe in these new ideas and that should, have, should apply to women as well. And you had uh, women kind of step up, especially this one. And just kind of say, yeah, I can go toe-to-toe -to -toe anytime and argue at any time with any guy. In fact, Madame de Pompadour was known for getting into a lot of enlightened discussions, a.k.a. arguments, and almost always winning. Uh, Benjamin Franklin loved this lady. Uh, he went to her salon all the time. Um, uh, just to kind of be around, around her, essentially. Uh, discuss, see, just be in the middle of that. Uh, that atmosphere. Uh, the thing is, she's a very young... When she started into this, she was very young. She was born into a very well-to-do family. Actually got a fairly good education. Um, and uh, was incredibly pretty. Uh, and, and so, like... How would I put this? Like, this is... Like, today, a lot of people look at Madame de Pompadour, especially from, uh, 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 from the perspective of women, saying... You know, this is the type of girl who's able to do it. She was able to climb the ranks. She was incredibly smart. She didn't let herself essentially get dominated. In fact, uh, you know, people that tried to dominate her, like Louis the Fifteenth, you could say, uh, she turned around and kind of turned it on him. Because if you're reading this right now, uh, she becomes very popular, very famous, and she, because she's also very beautiful, she catches the eye of the king. And because of the Versailles life that I talked about in the last unit, or last lesson, last Age of Absolutism unit. Louis XV had a very, let's put it this way, they had things called the official mistress to the king, where Louis XV actually asks Marie, Madame de Pompadour to be his official mistress, she accepts, and he presents her to the court of Versailles saying, here is my new official mistress, and everybody's there clapping, oh, good choice, even his wife, even the queen is there like, oh yeah, it's like, it's just like weird. And then a lot of people, also, like especially at the time, people are like, you know, Madame de Pompadour, what are you doing? You know, like you're going against all these things you talked about. But the thing is, is that she pretty much knew what she was doing. Now she's the official mistress. She could also act in the name of the king many times. In fact, for almost a decade, 
but Louis XV was just kind of partying, uh, living the Versailles life, she actually started running the country and started enacting a lot of reforms uh, within France that were more on the Enlightenment side, kind of making some uh, changes to France. Um, anyways, kind of funny on that side, but this is she's definitely one of the women of the Enlightenment that is very much looked up to. Uh, I'm going to stop. I could go more on Madame de Pompidou. If you want to know more, please do. Uh, or like look it up on your own if you'd like to, basically. Now, just really quickly, I've only covered... Well, I'll put them up. I've only covered... Uh, what just happened? I didn't mean to, oh, okay. I've only covered uh, uh, a few people, the more important ones, you could say, in the Enlightenment, but there's tons. And I'm going to put a, hu put a huge list up here. You guys don't need to necessarily write all these down unless you feel like you want to. But it's just the idea of just giving you all of these influential people during the time. I'm going to first off start with another woman, Mary Wollstonecraft, if you've heard of her. Uh, David Hume, Edmund Burke, George Berkeley, Dennis Diderot. By the way, he's the guy that came up with the first encyclopedia that we talked about in the very first lesson. Uh, Benjamin Franklin, who was just referencing a little bit, a little bit ago, but you could say is like the main Enlightenment thinker of for the United States. Uh, but so is Thomas Jefferson, uh, Thomas Paine, Sam Adams, John Adams, Abigail Adams, a lot of Adams, yes, very philosophical family, but very influential in the founding of the United States, too, based off of the, their Enlightenment thoughts. And then a, a German guy named Immanuel Kant. So again, all these guys, incredibly important, especially the American ones for the founding of the United States. Uh, there's more I could put up there. There's hundreds more I could put up there. But again, if you just want a good idea of just very influential people in our lives today, kind of ideas that we pull from that make us Americans from an American point of view, the people I covered earlier, and then this list right here, there you go. So I'm just going to leave that at that. Now, I said I was going to get into this two lessons ago. Now I'm finally getting into it. What does the social contract look like for the United States? It looks like this. If you notice, it looks a little bit more like the free society, not all the way to the right. Uh, to right. You don't have this social contract all the way over there, um, but it's pretty far. And yeah, we're supposed to have a lot of choices to ourselves. But again, our founding fathers understood that the social contract uh, could you know, get pushed too far this way. So like, how do we stop that? How do we stop? too many individual freedoms being taken away so that a society in the name of safety and security becomes too totalitarian, becomes too unhappy, where people have control of their own lives. Is that right? We need a constitution with a bill of rights. You know, your right to free speech should never be taken away. Uh, right to bear arms should be never taken, uh, that should always be around, never taken away. Right to the free press, never taken away. Right to, to religious worship or worshiping the way you want to worship should never be taken away. You know, the First and Second Amendments, uh, big time, are the two big ones just saying, you know, like I use the nice Lord of the Rings reference there, but you cannot take these away ever. Never, ever should those be taken away. American citizens should always have these. So, yes, the government can argue back and forth like, you know what, this is a time where we need to take away a little bit more of those freedoms. Like, for instance, uh, imposing the income tax in World War I 100 years ago. There was no income tax before that. That was the government deciding, you know what, we need to take some of Americans, we need to take money away from American paychecks. They don't have a choice in it, but this is for the good of everybody because we just need to win this war. And we need the money to do it. So, you know, that's taking away that choice. But that's, that was in here, essentially. That's not breaking, okay, we can get to this argument a little bit later. But it's essentially not breaking the Constitution, uh, like the First and Second Amendments, definitely. You could say it's taking away people's right to pursuit of happiness. But, again, different discussion. So, but yeah, the slider of the social contract can slide in between these two areas, but it cannot get past that wall that is the Constitution of the United States. From everything we talked about, the social contract earlier, um, and now seeing this, and after all the people we just talked about, like Voltaire and Adam Smith, and especially guys like John Locke and Montesquieu, uh, hopefully, I'm hoping that's making a lot of sense to you and you're understanding the world that you live in. 
And again, I'll just put this in there one more time. Uh, well, actually, this is a good thing to talk about right now. The quarantine, COVID-19 right now. A lot of things have actually happened where that line has actually gone through the Constitution. And a lot of people are like, well, maybe it needed to. Maybe, you know, in this extreme situation, the Constitution isn't valid. Um, I'll leave that discussion for another time. The fact of the matter is, it has. It, uh, there are things happening or be, things that are being instituted that are technically unconstitutional. Uh, right to free assembly, uh, the idea that you can't get into groups, uh, you can't go, uh, you know, like, like this isn't happening in Utah, but other states it's been happening where you know people can get arrested or fined uh, for breaking essentially social uh, distancing, I guess, laws now. The states there where this is happening where I've seen some issues are states like New York, uh, Michigan, Kentucky, um, even Alabama. Uh, there's been some mayors and, and governors that are just have done things that are definitely breaking the Constitution. Yet most people seem like they might be all right with it or just wondering like what's going on or this is surreal. Maybe we'll go back to normality after this. And, but we're having huge social contract issues right now. thing is... You know, uh, and this isn't the idea that we shouldn't be social distancing and things like that. Uh, but it comes down to, is it still your choice to social distance? Is the government suggesting you do this? Or is the government forcing you to do this? That's the big deal there. If the government is forcing you to do it, uh, in some cases, not all cases, but in some cases, it is, breaking the con it is uh, going through that wall of the Constitution on the social contract. Um, if the government suggests it and we choose to follow along with it, then that is still allowed to be our choice. And if everybody does it, then there's nothing unconstitutional about that if it's your choice. So, anyways, I could go way more into this. Um, but again, I highly recommend, not an assignment, but I recommend just having this conversation around the dinner table. Uh, and parents and things like that, just... You know, what was life like before this happened versus like, uh, and you know, freedoms you enjoyed versus uh, things you would love to do now that you feel like you just can't. Um, whether your choice or not, or do you feel like this is the government doing too? Do you feel like this is you choosing uh, to go along with this for the safety of all? Because you feel like, yeah, I want to do my part as, as a citizen of the United States to keep people safe. So anyways, moving on. Now, this won't take very long this part right here. At least it shouldn't. But challenges to absolutism. Notice the last unit was called the Age of Absolutism. Well, because of the Enlightenment and ideas of the Enlightenment, they challenged the idea of absolute power. And here's the three main things. English Civil War, American Revolution, French Revolution. Are there others? Yes. There's the Haitian Revolution. Uh, there's the Mexican War of Independence. Uh, there's a bunch of stuff that happens, actually, that, that challenges absolutism. But we're for this class, we're just going to be focusing on these ones. We've already talked about the English Civil War, actually. Simply put is this. I'm just going to put this all up right now because we've already taken these notes in a way on the last unit. Uh, but the reason why I'm including it in this unit, too, is when Parliament chops the head off of the king because they did not agree with his governance and felt like the government should be more on the people than it should have been on just him, that's challenging absolutism with saying there is no divine right of kings. We shouldn't have kings. People can rule better than the king can. And so therefore, it's a challenge to absolutism. Now, because <laughs> it just turns into a bit of a dictatorship of Oliver Cromwell later on, people are like, let's just go back to having a king. So this challenged absolutism, but didn't kill it. The next major challenge to absolutism was the American Revolution. And this was a successful challenge to absolutism, but it isn't considered the death knell of absolutism because... It was on a continent on the other side of the world. It wasn't in Europe itself. So, but yeah, basically, the United States rebels based off Enlightenment principles. Uh, against all odds, they win. Uh, and then try to set up a new government based off of uh, Enlightenment ideals, essentially. It took a lot of discussion, took a lot of compromise. Uh, this is that's all stuff you're supposed to learn in U.S. history class. Of just all the stuff, it, it was a hard thing to do. This was not easy. 
to start up the United States of America, and it had a lot of hiccups in the beginning. You know, like the Articles of Confederation not working out, have to be replaced the Constitution. But in the end, the two main found you could say founding documents of what the United States is today, the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution of the United States, aren't just viewed as like awesome Enlightenment documents and amazing, just ingenious documents from Enlightenment from American perspective. They've actually inspired almost every um, Enlightenment revolution the world around uh, to this day. And so remain the most successful and celebrated documents, Enlightenment documents to this day. Not just from an American perspective, but from a world perspective. Yeah. And that's that. So when we... Um, uh, this ends the Age of Enlight the, the Enlightenment portion of the notes. What we're going to get into next is just the French Revolution. Uh, I'm going to show you what happens there and give you the story on that one next week. Anyways, you guys have a good day.